we are underway. Thank you. I might also suggest to all of you, you might put this into speaker view in your upper right, if, if you haven't already. Okay. All right, there we are. Of course, just there. Yeah. Get this over. Yep. Thank you, everyone, very Bye. much for coming to our presentation. We're, we are going to present the evidence from near death experiences that the mind of a person is a separate entity that unites with the brain and body in ordinary consciousness. We will then discuss how the non-material mind entity works with the brain and what the next step should be in mind-brain research. You can read more about our research at our website, selfconsciousmind.com. So what are the factors in the past that enabled the rapid acceptance of a new scientific paradigm? Here are two examples based on the ideas of philosopher Herbert Butterfield. We're grateful to researcher Julie Billingham for suggesting Butterfield. In the development of the modern heliocentric theory of planetary motion, Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, and Descartes struggled for many years to fit the observed motion of the planets around the sun. There was no comprehensive framework. Certain planetary motions were anomalous and didn't fit their models, which used epicycles, elliptical orbits, or planetary vortices. Isaac Newton developed a new intellectual framework that all bodies of mass attract one another at a distance, the universal law of gravity fully explaining the observed planetary motion. In the development of the model of the internal structure of the atom, Lord Kelvin, J.J. Thompson, and Ernest Rutherford proposed several models, particle vortices, the plum pudding model, and the electron cloud model. Again, there was no comprehensive framework and the problem was thought to be too complex to solve. Niels Bohr proposed a solar system-like model based on Max Planck's new intellectual framework of quantized energy. Bohr's model fit the observed hydrogen spectrum precisely within experimental error. Here are the common threads in the process of past scientific revolutions. First, there was the recognition of anomalies, that is phenomena still needing explanation. A proliferation of theories were proposed to address some of the anomalies, but were formulated under the existing scientific framework, resulting in ad hoc additions to the framework. Finally, there was the realization that, quoting Butterfield, the problem could not be solved within the framework of the older system of ideas. It required a transposition in the mind. Ultimately, leading edge scientists adopted a radically new way of viewing the problem, which led to a new framework and model. Newton proposed that gravitation applies to all bodies of mass. Bohr applied Planck's non-continuous quantum energy to the electron in the hydrogen atom and ultimately to all atoms. Therefore, quoting Butterfield, the requirements for a successful scientific revolution are 
to develop an encompassing approach that grasps the whole in a mighty synthesis, to establish an adequate intellectual framework, one that addresses the anomalies, to describe a theory and a model that explains the anomalies, providing a demonstration that fits the facts on the whole when applied to the phenomena in detail. The new theory needs to encompass already understood phenomena. So in developing a framework for consciousness, we need to start by asking what is consciousness? How does it manifest in the world? Does human consciousness survive the death of the physical body? There is a proliferation of theories about consciousness, physicalism, idealism, panpsychism, neutral monism, dualism. Yet the hard problem of consciousness is Brain electrical activity closely correlates with conscious awareness, the so-called neural correlates of consciousness. This picture is an MEG, magnetoencephalography image, of a person's brain when she reads a word. The sequence is about four-tenths of a second long. Even so, the close correlation with brain activity does not address the fundamental question of how brain activity produces subjective experiences. We propose that consciousness, that is the experience of subjective awareness, manifests in the world in living beings, especially in individual human beings. Furthermore, consciousness needs to be described through the empirical evidence of our own subjective experiences and through the reported experiences of others. The common experiences shared by numerous people can be taken as objectively real. Subjectively, one's awareness has a particular locus. That is, it is located in a particular position in space and has a particular perspective or point of view. This is understandable, of course, because one is generally embodied in a particular physical body. But one can project their locus of awareness, for example, through an image-guided surgical instrument to perform microsurgery, or through a flight simulator to practice flight maneuvers. Also, one experiences different faculties, such as perception, thought, feelings, volition, memory, self-awareness, and aging. We call the center of subjective awareness the mind, which has its particular locus and point of view. A new perspective is possible if we expand the existing framework for consciousness to include anomalous experiences of consciousness. Anomalous phenomena are phenomena that can't be readily re explained in normal scientific terms, such as experiences reported in near-death experiences, NDEs, shared death experiences, after-death community. Robert, we lost your audio. Robert? Oh. If you could start this slide over again. Okay. Can you hear us now? Yes. Okay. Sorry. What happened? Come on, doesn't matter. A new perspective is possible if we expand the existing framework for consciousness to include anomalous experiences of consciousness. Anomalous phenomena are phenomena that can't be readily explained in normal scientific terms, such as experiences reported in NDEs, shared death experiences, after-death communications. Our research focuses on NDEs because NDEers experience vivid, hyperreal awareness, 
while experiencing an apparent separation from the physical body, during which the locus of awareness is outside the physical body. There are numerous reported cases during NDEs of verified, accurate, veridical perceptions of the physical realm while out of body, especially while the brain is non-functional. In these cases, the NDE -er reports particular perceptions in the physical realm from a perspective outside their physical body, which should not have been possible either because their brain was not functional or the object was out of their physical line of sight or both. See more than five dozen of these verified cases documented in the book, The Self Does Not Die. Here is case 3.33 of veridical out-of-body perceptions from The Self Does Not Die. Lauren Belge is a critical care physician whose patient Howard suffered a cardiac arrest while recovering from surgery in the ICU. Howard was completely unconscious, but was resuscitated by several defibrillation shocks and was put on a ventilator. Howard later reported that he shot out of the top of his head saying, I'm looking down on my body and it feels like I'm bobbing and bouncing against the ceiling. With the thought that maybe he was to go somewhere, he says, I felt myself rising up through the ceiling and it was like I was going through the structure of the building. I could feel the different densities of passing through insulation. I saw wiring, some pipes, and then I was in this other room. It looked like a hospital, but it was very quiet, like there was no one there. There were people in the beds that looked like mannequins, and they had IVs hooked up to them, but they didn't look real. In the center was an open area that looked like a collection of workstations with computers. Right above his ICU room is a nurse training center with medical mannequins on some of the beds. And in the center, a collection of workspaces with computers. Dr. Belge and the attending nurse were astonished at the accuracy of Howard's description. And because the presence of the nurse training center was not generally known, not even by non-nursing staff. The number of these cases and the weight of evidence in them is strong enough to assert that the locus of awareness has, in fact, separated from the physical body. Veridical perceptions from a vantage point separate from the body, particularly while the brain is non-functional, imply that one's subjective awareness can function independent of the physical brain. They imply that one's awareness, the mind, in general, can separate from the physical body and operate independently of it. Conceptually, the mind ceases to be a byproduct of brain neural activity and can now be viewed as an autonomous conscious entity. The concept of a mind entity separate from the physical body can serve as a new intellectual framework for explaining consciousness. Evidence from numerous NDEs gives a picture of the nature of the outer body mind. First, during an NDE, the mind functions as a cohesive unit. The NDE experiences that their entire being has separated from the body. There is a continuity of subjective awareness throughout the separation and return, even in cases of bouncing repeatedly in and out of body like a ping pong ball. All aspects of their mind or self are still consciously present to them throughout the NDE. Subjectively, 
the NDE experiences all cognitive faculties. The out of body NDE does not identify with the physical body. Some NDE exclaim, that physical body wasn't me. The outer body mind is objectively real. The end of the ear can be seen by animals. Jerry Casebell experienced an NDE at age seven. He died during surgery and left his body. Jerry floated over a school playground located just north of the hospital. There were lots of children playing outside there. A German shepherd dog was playing with the children. Jerry floated down to investigate. The dog sensed his presence and playfully barked at him. Jerry positioned himself just a few inches above where the dog could jump, teasing the animal by staying just out of reach. The dog barked and jumped up at him, wagging his tail excitedly, barking. Jerry told us that he and the dog looked into each other's eyes. I was moving up, down, and to the sides. We moved together like a dance. ND ears can also be seen by other people. An apparitional NDE is a particular event in an NDE in which the outer body NDE visits and communicates in some way with a living person. And both accounts of the encounter are subsequently verified to be consistent with one another. There are seven verified apparitional cases documented in the self does not die. These experiences strongly suggest that a person's mind is a separate entity that is independent of the body. The mind is objectively real, a real thing, a real being. All faculties of cognition occur in the mind, not in the brain. In effect, the separate mind is the essence of the person. The separation of the mind from the body is a general phenomenon. The mind can separate from the body under many different circumstances, not just near death, as in cardiac arrest, severe trauma, or coma. There are also NDE-like cases that are not close to death, as in fainting, sleep, meditation, alcohol, or drugs. The person's awareness separates even though the brain is still functional. Such cases are called near-death-like experiences, NDLEs. The subjective experiences of NDEs and NDLEs are indistinguishable with the same number and intensity of NDE elements. Therefore, NDEs are a general phenomena regardless of the antecedent causes. This fact implies there is a common proximate cause for all NDEs and NDLEs regardless of antecedent causes. The main common feature of all NDE and NDE-like experiences is the separation of subjective awareness from the body. Therefore, we propose that the common proximate cause of all NDE and NDE-like experiences is the actual separation of the mind from the physical body rather than any other antecedent cause. The NDE evidence so far indicates the mind is a separate entity that can separate from and operate independently of the physical body. The mind entity is an objectively real thing, a real being. 
all faculties of cognition occur in the mind, not in the brain. Outer body in the ears experience easily passing through solid objects like walls. Recall the case of Lauren Belge's patient, Howard. Therefore, the mind appears to be non-material, not made up of material particles, atoms, and molecules. The mind can merge and be coextensive with physical objects like the body and brain. Our mind entity hypothesis states, the human being consists of a non-material mind or center of subjective awareness that is united, coextensive, and integrated with the physical body. The mind entity is the seat of consciousness of the person. All cognitive faculties reside in the mind, not in the brain. There are two possible states of awareness, the in-body state and the outer body state. For the in-body state, there is a close correlation between brain neural activity and subjective awareness. Therefore, the mind entity is completely dependent on the brain's electrical activity for subjective awareness. The mind entity must interact with the brain to achieve subjective awareness, even of its own mental content and to effect willed movement. For the out-of-body state in an NDE, the mind entity separates from the body and operates independent of the brain. For this theory to be consonant with existing scientific knowledge, there must be some form of causal energetic interaction between the mind and the brain and some plausible mechanism of interaction. How could a non-material mind interact with the material brain to achieve consciousness. There is strong evidence that the out-of-body mind does interact with physical processes, with light, sound waves in the air, and solid matter, giving rise to subjective sensations and accurate veridical perceptions in the physical realm. There are also numerous reports that NDEs encounter a subtle resistance or increased density when passing through solid matter. Again, recall the case of NDE Howard passing through different layers of insulation. This implies a subtle push-pull force when the outer body mind entity passes through solid matter, like passing your hand through water. According to Newton's third law of motion, for every force of one object on another, there is an equal and opposite opposing force. There is also evidence that the end ears can interact with the neural processes of an in-body person. Example, an NDE ear passed her hand through the doctor's arm and felt something that was the consistency of very rarefied gelatin that seemed to have an electric current running through it. Example, an NDE ear reported tickling the nose of a patient with dementia, causing her to sneeze. Therefore, the evidence indicates the mind can interact with matter and specifically with neural electrical processes, both to sense and to trigger neural electrical activity. Most philosophers and scientists reject dualist theories like ours because they think it's impossible for a non-material mind to interact with a physical brain. They consider consciousness purely the result of brain processes. 
we address the philosophical objections to interactionist dualism. First, there is strong evidence that the out-of-body mind interacts with physical processes, giving rise to phenomenal perceptions in the end of ears mind. And there is evidence that a subtle, previously unrecognized two-way force is involved in mind-matter interactions. There are three specific philosophical challenges to interactionist dualism. First, taking the mind to be a thing is a category error because the mind is simply the collection of a person's dispositions and capacities resulting from brain activity. It is not a thing. So the mind is in a different category from physical objects like a brain. However, the non-material mind is actually in the same category as physical objects because the mind is an objectively real thing that unites with the brain and body. Secondly, the causal pairing problem of how a non-material mind existing outside physical space can causally interact with a physical object like a brain. The mind must interact in spatial relation to the brain. In our view, the non-material mind is a three-dimensional object in physical space, which merges and pairs with the physical brain. The mind and brain are located in intimate spatial relation to one another and exert direct causal interactions with each other. Third, the causal closure of the physical, stating that all physical effects have only physical causes. In our theory, the mind is non-material, yet interacts with physical processes and thus takes part in physical causation. The mind interfaces with the brain at specific points of contact at the surface of the cortex. The question remains, how does the mind interface with the brain? Because the ND ear retains all cognitive faculties while out of body, these faculties reside in the mind, not in the brain. Even in the ordinary consciousness, all faculties of cognition and all mental content originate in the mind. However, the mind entity is completely dependent on the brain's electrical activity for subjective awareness. Therefore, in ordinary consciousness, the mind must work through the brain's neural activity for subjective awareness, even awareness of its own mental content. Neuroscientist Benjamin Libet found that it takes time for neural activation to build up to conscious awareness. Libet's time on principle is that subjective awareness requires a minimum duration of 300 to 500 milliseconds of neural activity. Otherwise, the stimulus remains unconscious, a subliminal stimulation. Libet distinguished between detection and subjective awareness. Before awareness occurs, the stimulus is still detected and one can still respond within 100 milliseconds. For example, a baseball batter can adjust to swing before being subjectively aware of the pitch. Even without subjective awareness, subliminal stimulations are detected and have an effect. It's a phenomenon called subliminal priming. The stimulus is detected even at its first appearance with a so-called evoked potential in the brain, and then goes through a process of coming to awareness. 
because the initial appearance was detected, the person knows when the stimulus started, even though the sensation was subliminal for 300 milliseconds or longer. This is called the backward referral in time. The process of coming to awareness applies to all awareness, awareness of sensory perceptions and also of inward or endogenous thoughts, imaginations, etc. Libet's findings have now been confirmed in more recent studies of what's called conscious processing. In our view, the mind is engaged throughout the process of coming to awareness, from detection of a stimulus to subjective awareness. The mind adds its mental content by impressing the content on the specific brain regions for that cognitive function. The neural activations in these regions bring the mental content to subjective awareness. The primary purpose of cortical neural activations is to bring the mind's mental content to subjective awareness. To explore how the mind works with the brain, we'd like to examine what goes on in the brain when we read a word. Here is an example of the brain activity with electroencephalography, EEG, when a person reads a single word. EEG measures the electrical voltage at different areas on the scalp. Blue-green here means minus voltage. When reading words one by one, an incongruent word in a sentence evokes a strong minus voltage at the top of the scalp. In the graph, minus voltages are plotted up and time is on the x-axis. In reading a word, there is a typical pattern of electrical activity for about half a second. Ordinarily, the pattern follows this lower trace, the black line. But when Run reads an incongruent word in a sentence, there is an unusual strong minus voltage at the top of the scalp, peaking at 400 milliseconds, called N400. When we read words in a sentence, the earlier words establish the context. Then when reading the next word, as in the Dutch trains are yellow, the word yellow fits with the context of Dutch trains. So in our view, the full process of reading a single word happens this way. At 115 milliseconds, the N1 minus voltage peak is associated with detecting the percept, the word percept, the form of the word. The target word in the sentence shown here is Y-E-L-L-O-W, as in the Dutch trains are yellow. At 200 milliseconds, the P2 plus voltage peak is associated with detecting the meaning of the word the meaning or concept of yellow, namely a bright warm color. At 400 milliseconds, the minus voltage peak is associated with awareness of how congruent or incongruent the word is in context. Yellow is congruent because the Dutch trains are in fact yellow, an example of world knowledge. And the trace follows the typical neural pattern of the black line. If we say the Dutch trains are white or sour, there is a large peak at N400 because white is incongruent and sour is really anomalous. So perception and comprehension proceed in three distinct, distinct stages in time. First, detect the form of the word. Second, recognize the meaning of the word. Finally, evaluate the word's meaning in the current context as the word comes to awareness. The mind is involved at each stage. 
Now, in, in reading a single word, the mind also engages three specific regions of the brain. Magnetoencephalography, MEG, uses the brain's magnetic fields to indicate where electrical activity in the brain occurs. These are MEG recordings of a person reading a single word. In the case shown here, it's a novel word, which produces a large N400. The neural activations are shown in red and yellow and occur sequentially in three different brain regions. These regions correspond to the three EEG peaks on the previous slide. One, detecting the form of the word in the occipital region on the inside surface of the hemispheres. Two, intuiting the meaning of the word or concept on the outside surface in the visual word form area and occipitotemporal area. And three, evaluating the congruence of the word in the current context in temporal and prefrontal regions. In the third stage, as words are read, each new word adds to and builds the context of the sentence. The context is held in the mind. Note that there is a gap in the timing when the activity in one region starts falling after its peak between steps one and two and steps two and three. The activity in one region starts falling before the next region's activity starts up. In our view, these are the times that the mind is impressing its mental content on the next brain region, followed by the neural activity in that region. In our model, neural activations are needed to bring mental content to conscious awareness. So the mind must first impress its conceptual content on the appropriate brain regions, inducing neural activations. The neural activations in those regions act as a mirror to bring the mental content to awareness. Neural activations indicate that the mind's mental content is in the process of coming to awareness. This next diagram is a schematic view of this process, showing the brain and the mind coextensive with it. In actuality, the mind it closely interfaces just with the surface of the cortex. Very briefly, in ordinary consciousness, the mind interfaces and works with the brain by inducing neural firing that allows the mental content in the mind to come to awareness. In a little more detail, the mind first impresses its mental content, for example, the meaning of a word, on a brain region. The neural activation in that region acts as a mirror that to bring the mental content to awareness. So here's how we view now the involvement of the mind in the stages of reading a word in context. First, at 115 milliseconds, the mind detects the percept, the form of the word. In this case, the word is W-H-I-T-E. In the sentence, the Dutch trains are white in the occipital region. The mind decodes the percept as the form of an English word, the word white, and intuits the concept or meaning of white. After the peak, based on this content, the mind impresses the meaning of the color white on the next regions, the visual word form area and related language areas. The meaning of white is still subliminal at this point. The neural activity in these new regions begins. At 165 milliseconds, the mind detects the meaning of the concept white. The mind evaluates the incongruity of the color white in the context of Dutch trains. 
After the peak, the mind impresses the incongruity of Dutch trains being white on the next regions, the temporal and prefrontal areas. The incongruity is still subliminal at this point. The neural activity in these regions begins. At, a, at 400 milliseconds, the mind comes to awareness of the incongruity of white in the context of Dutch trains. The mind entity model is applicable to all conscious experience. We propose this is the way consciousness works. There are two largely distinct complementary brain networks shown in this map of the brain, showing the two sides of the left hemisphere with its outside and inside surfaces. The two complementary networks are first an externally directed perceptual and motor system involving sensory areas in yellow. The mind impresses its semantic content here to recognize and interpret perceptions. Second, an inwardly directed conceptual system used in semantic tasks. That's called the default network in red. The mind impresses its semantic content here for inward thought, such as daydreaming, solving a mental problem, planning a shopping list, etc. In this model, the mind is engaged effectively throughout the neocortex with external sensory processes, with external motor processes, with inward sources of information. The mind impresses its mental content in all cortical regions except the purely input modalities in the primary sensory areas. The mind entity theory is a radical departure from the prevalent physical view in neuroscience. In this theory, all mental content comes from the mind and is impressed on brain regions, causing activations which bring the content to subjective awareness. So in this theory, the brain does not generate mental content, nor is mental content and memory retained in brain structures, nor does the brain perform mental computations. In this theory, semantic memory, working memory, episodic memory, and implicit or pattern memory are all carried in the mind not in brain structures. So in this theory, there are no memory traces in the cortex, hippocampus, or cerebellum. Long-term potentiation serves not to store mental content as traces, but rather facilitate memory formation in the mind and memory recall from the mind. The specialized memory structures in the hippocampus for episodic memory and the cerebellum for pattern memory act as specialized interfaces with the mind. The brain's function is to support the mind in its perceptual and inward endogenous mental processes. The brain's neural action potentials act as a mirror that enables the mind to come to awareness of its cognitive content. Specific cognitive content is mirrored in specialized brain regions. For example, the fusiform face area, the visual word form area, etc. In the mind entity theory, the mind impresses its mental content on cortical neurons and causes action potentials, which bring the mental content to awareness. This implies that the interface of the mind with the brain is at the surface of the cortex in the gray matter. The gray matter contains pyramidal neurons with vertical apical dendrites reaching from the soma to the surface of the cortex and basal dendrites 
branching out horizontally from the soma. On the dendrites, there are innumerable nodules called dendritic spines. The mind must be able to trigger action potentials in the pyramidal neurons and in some way sense the resulting action potentials. Out of body ND ears can directly sense neural activity in an in body person. Therefore, the mind most likely senses the back propagation of action potentials when they spread back throughout the dendritic arbor, as this figure shows. The question now is, how does the mind trigger action potentials? Volatile or inhalation anesthetics provide evidence for how the mind operates with the brain. Volatile anesthetics like diethyl ether or isoflurane readily cause the loss of consciousness and therefore inhibit the action of the mind. Volatile anesthetics also alter the properties of the dendritic spines on the pyramidal neurons. The dendrite here is in green and the spines are the red structures. Volatile anesthetics pass through the spine wall and unravel the spine's cytoskeleton, causing the spines temporarily to shrink and collapse. This diagram shows the effects of isoflurane. The normal spine structure is shown at the top. In the middle with isoflurane at clinical concentrations, the spines have shrunk and collapsed. These effects are reversed at the bottom when the anesthetic is washed out and the cytoskeleton is reassembled. The dendritic spines contain an internal cytoskeleton consisting of microfilaments of a substance called F-actin. The F-actin filaments maintain the spine's shape and rigidity and help with vesicle movement within the spine. F-actin filaments are polymers of a basic actin unit strung together. These structural filaments are unraveled by volatile anesthetics and can subsequently be reassembled. The important thing is, volatile anesthetics cause the loss of consciousness. They also unravel the F-actin filaments in dendritic spines. Because these facts appear to be related, we propose that the interface for the mind to trigger action potentials is located in the dendritic spines. The mechanism of interaction must rely on interaction of the mind with spine effectin filaments and would be disrupted by anesthetics, preventing mind-induced neural activity and therefore subjective awareness. We believe such an interface and mechanism exists in the dendritic spines. This is a schematic of a dendritic spine with its spine head and spine neck connected to its dendrite, taken from a book by researcher Raphael Yuste. Numerous F-actin filaments maintain the structure of the spine neck and spine head. At the center are several stores of positively charged calcium ions in a collection of vesicles called the spine apparatus. The spine apparatus also has F-actin filaments associated with it. In our view, the mind can trigger release of calcium ions from the spine apparatus by interacting with the spine apparatus filaments causing a kind of mind-induced calcium release. The positive calcium ions flow into the dendrite and induce dendritic spikes, which can then trigger an action potential. The action potential in turn causes an influx of calcium ions back throughout the spines. The calcium ions are stored again in the spine apparatus resetting the neuron for further action potentials. Similar calcium ion 
calcium driven mechanisms are well understood and operate throughout the body, for example, in regulating the heartbeat. So volatile anesthetics unravel the F-actin filaments in the spine such that the mind can't trigger the release of calcium ions from the spine apparatus. This pre prevents mind-induced action potentials and causes the loss of consciousness because the mental content remains unconscious. When the anesthetic has washed out, the F-actin reforms, enabling consciousness to return. In this view, the mind triggers action potentials only by triggering the spine F-actin filaments. The force needed to trigger the actin filaments is likely very small, probably comparable to the subtle resistance and the ears report when passing through solid matter. In contrast, the force of an action potential propagating back throughout the dendritic arbor can be inferred in this image of a series of action potentials. The energy of the back propagation resets the neuron for further action potentials, allowing it to achieve high firing rates. In the mind entity theory, the mind impresses its mental content in all cortical regions, yellow and red, except in the primary sensory regions for sight, hearing, and touch. Since the primary sensory areas are purely input modalities, the mind does not impress its mental content in these areas. These points suggest that there should be more dendritic spines in the yellow and red regions compared to the primary sensory regions. This prediction is validated by studies done by Guy Elston, for example, shown here in estimating the number of spines in different regions of the cortex. In the human brain, the dendritic spine densities are significantly higher in the temporal and frontal lobes compared with the occipital lobe. Recalling Herbert Butterfield's thesis, a true revolution in science requires a transposition in thinking that grasps the whole and a broader synthesis of the phenomena, creating a conceptual framework that explains the anomalies. We propose that the concept of an autonomous mind entity can serve as a new conceptual framework for explaining consciousness. Physicist William Bragg said, the important thing in science is not so much to obtain new facts as to discover new ways of thinking about them. There are several avenues to help scientists make the mental transposition to this new framework. The first approach is to show that the new framework better explains existing neurological phenomena, phenomena that are well known but not fully understood. These would include consciousness, semantic knowledge, perception, etc. Secondly, show that the new framework explains the anomalies of neuroscience. For example, split brain phenomena, phantom limb phenomena. Third, validate the proposed mind brain mechanism through improved clinical therapies and results. For example, therapies apply to disorders of consciousness like unresponsive wakeful state and minima, minimally conscious state. Finally, validate the proposed mind-brain mechanism through experimental testing. For example, the interaction of a person's energetic field with neurons, experimenting with a squid giant axon. For example, the interaction of a healer's energetic field with a subject's brain and body and validated by MRI or MEG scans. Thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Suzanne and Robert.
and I should get my video going. And we will now entertain questions from all of you. Um, if you would like, I will call on you if you would raise your hand. And to do that um, in reactions, if you click that button reactions, there's a tab to raise hand. And then I can call on you. And when I do, you can unmute then. If you can stay muted until you're called on, that would be helpful. And to get us started, um, Suzanne or Robert, if you could say something right at the end, you were mentioning phantom limbs. And if you could say just a tiny bit about what that is and how that's related. Right, we, we have done uh, experiments uh, studying phantom limbs. There's a, um, I, I was teaching high school uh, chemistry at Tara, high, uh, high school in Boulder and performing arts high school. And um, one of the teachers there had, was born without the fingers of, of her left hand. And she had a, 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 a feeling of her, so her hand looks like this, it's kind of like this. And um, where her fingers are, it, it just ends, but she can feel outside her body, outside the, the physical hand, uh, part of the hand. And, uh, and so she um, helped us with some experiments. But a phantom limb occurs whenever there is a limb lost uh, and it can be in, in other parts of the uh, physical body can be lost and there would be a sense of the phantom, uh, the phantom part still there. And what happens is the person that loses the arm, but still, you know, feels that it's out here. It feels, it feels, and they can feel it. And actually uh, Reiki and therapeutic touch healers can feel the hand and arm. And arm. Um, and actually, the, there's an interaction where the uh, therapist can, can feel the arm and the person can feel them touching the, the phantom arm. Wow. And, but the, the difficulty is that phantom limbs have, are associated with a lot of pain. And that, that in our view, is, has to do with the, the phantom. The phantom is really the, you could say, the etheric, etheric body mm -hmm. of the person of the arm mm -hmm. and uh, it is still, it is still connected, uh, uh, but not, not very well connected with the, the, the existing nerves that go and, uh, and when the interface between the phantom and, and the stump of the limb is not good. It, in other words, the, the phantom limb is not properly situated and, and, and kind of tied in, I don't know if you can see, tied into the, the elbow, let's say, if that's where the uh, amputation was. And, uh, and, and that causes pain. It causes a misfiring in the, in the corresponding area of the brain and, the, and, it, and that misfiring appears in a different area and that is, that is the source of the pain. So, um, so that's that's an ev that's evidence that that there's a there's an aspect of the human body uh, that is energetic and not physical, oh, and yeah. uh, and that's one of the things that uh, we would like to talk about. We we did a, a number of experiments with her, and um, yeah, and I, I wanted to say also that that this. This idea, the, the descriptions that we were making of the perception, um, you know, reading a word and intuiting the meaning, well, that comes directly out of the philosophy of freedom. Yeah, uh, I was just going to ask you that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, this is not at all, um, should not be at all alien to anthroposophists that um, there is a mind and that the mind intuits meanings. And uh, and the mind holds the meaning meanings in in uh, context uh, so that and and that, of course that's our experience you know when I when when we read a paragraph you know we're we're taking the whole paragraph and getting the whole context of that paragraph 
And if something else comes along and we say, wait a minute, that doesn't fit, you know, we see an incongruity because it does not match what we what we thought was the entire context. So this this is all philosophy of freedom, yeah. um, chapter five. <laughs> There's a question that came in. Um, if you you didn't mention in your talk uh, Steiner's model of physical body, etheric body, astral body, and ego. If you were to relate those to what you brought, could could you, you know, say something that's less than another hour? <laughs> <laughs> you want to do it? No. Before. All right. Well, of course, we have a physical body. We have an etheric body, energetic body, which is is somewhat related to the mind, but is actually tied to the physical body. Um, so the physical and etheric go together. Uh, so there's, there's an energetic aspect of the physical body, and there's also an energetic aspect of the mind, which is the astral and ego. And, um, and of course, the astral and ego leave the physical body in, in sleep. And, um, and we don't talk about all of that because we're, we're talking to um, the neuroscientists. And, um, <laughs> but... Uh, um, there, there is a, a lot of tie-in of, of what we're talking about in NDEs uh, to, um, to uh, anthroposophy. Uh, we gave a talk a year ago about um, the, or was it less than a year ago? <laughs> I can't remember. Um, about the um, relationship of, of NDEs uh, to Steiner's lectures in 1910, where he uh, predicted that the people would start in the 1930s to have a direct um, perception of the etheric Christ, mm -hmm. and um, and and that and it's interesting that in the 1930s, in 1935. Ida Wegman had an NDE in which she saw she saw Christ and also Rudolf Steiner, Rudolf Steiner. and uh, also in th at that time there were other people. Uh, particularly, we can we can trace the whole movement of near death experiences to a fellow named George Ritchie, who had his NDE as a twenty one year old, a twenty year old in um, nineteen forty three. And, um, and wrote a book about it. He encountered the being of light, the Christ. He identified as Christ and had a very extensive experience that really strongly influenced Raymond Moody, who, um, in fact, that is what motivated Raymond Moody to really take near-death experiences seriously and to study them and then to write his book, Life After Life. And George Ritchie wrote his book about his NDE in 1978. So Life After Life in 1975, George Ritchie's book, which is the first book really talking about near-death experiences in 1978. Now, George Ritchie ended up having a connection with the Anthroposophical Society. And um, because um, a fellow named Ted Roselle from Chicago, Chicago, I think, um, wrote a book about from Ann Arbor. Ann Arbor, okay. Uh, sorry, uh, Ted Roselle wrote a book about near-death experiences, showing the parallels of George Ritchie's experience and Rudolf Steiner's description of um, the spiritual world. And, and in fact, that's what led us to near-death experiences while we were talking about anthroposophy, yes. So, so when we started our, our work with, in earnest about exploring the phenomena of near-death experience, um, we were challenged right at the very beginning by two of the foremost re NDE researchers, Bruce Grayson and Peter Fennick. And they both said to us at different times, you must demonstrate the mechanism. You have to show us 
how the mind interacts with, a phys with something that's physical and material. So that's why we've had to go this route to bring in what we knew philosophically, what we knew through our esoteric studies, and to show the demonstration of spirit works in matter. You can't have matter without spirit. There always has to be some kind of um, representation or evidence of this working of, the, of an invisible force, the spiritual, within matter, within, within the human physical body. So that's that's the frontier that we've been that all of science needs to be able to bridge and get to that matter that spirit works in matter and that we are spiritual beings in a physical form and that we don't die with our body the body is let gone it passes away but the human being its spirit its essence of its being does not die our consciousness does not continues so this, that's why we, you know, we're, we, we have this kind of format with this particular talk is you got to be able to, to speak with the people who in these different science fields are working and with the phenomena that they're studying the data that they're coming up with, but their interpretation, in many times they say, we don't know what this means, but it's right there in front of them if they can begin to take on um, a viewpoint that is more than just the physicality. The new framework. The yeah. new framework. So questions from the audience. Any, um, yeah, I'll take one that's here in my chat. Um, you talked about the mind entity somehow stimulating the uh, dendrites or the F actin or something like this. Um, spines. Yeah, this in the dendritic spines. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's still not quite clear, apparently, um, how a non physical entity actually does that stimulation. Is it by vibrations of some kind? And or, you know, or what could you it, say more? Yeah, well, actually, we, we should go a little more detail um, about the, um, the phenomena. So an, an out-of-body person in an MDE interacts with light because they can see uh, uh, with the ambient light. And if there isn't much ambient light, they can't see in the physical world. So their, their senses are interacting with, their out of body, non-material senses are interacting with light. And also they can hear, and they can hear, uh, you know, inanimate things like the, the, the beep of a um, heart monitor. And, um, and so they are interacting with the uh, vibrations, uh, physical vibrations in the air. And uh, they also have this in very interesting interaction with passing through solid matter. Uh, they easily pass through walls and um, ceilings. Um, and they, they also can see through these things. Um, but they, um, there's this resistance. Sometimes it's, some, many NDEs do not report that they felt anything, but some do. And it's pretty consistent where, you know, they passing through, they feel a slight resistance or increased density. So there is an interaction also with physical matter. And that interaction, because there's a resistance, there's a force. And so the, the, the mind entity passing through the solid object, exerting a subtle force on, on uh, the, the wall, let's say, it's not going to do much of anything. It's a very subtle energy. But at, at the level of inside a spine, uh, the, fill, the, the cytoskeleton microfilaments inside the spine uh, is a very small piece of matter, but it doesn't, wouldn't take very much to, to move it. 
uh, much energy to move it. And that's what we're postulating is how this works. There has to be some way that the, that the mind can, can trigger a, an action potential. And the way you trigger action potentials with, is with dendritic spikes. And the way dendritic spikes occur, usually it's, there's a synapse that comes into the, the spine and triggers a release of positive ions. But here we're saying there's, not, there's no synapse. It's the mind. The mind is acting Direct. directly on this uh, uh, spine apparatus and release, somehow releasing the calcium ions, which are stored there. <clears throat> they don't, neuroscientists don't know why we have these calcium stores in the dendritic spines. So this is all mystery, but it, it's not a mystery if you think about the action of uh, anesthetics. <laughs> so there is there is a subtle force that the mind can it can exert on these tiny microfilaments uh, that uh, will trigger the release of a small amount of calcium ions, which then triggers a a dendritic spike, which then triggers an action potential. Wonderful. And then, of course, it's, we're do, it's doing it on many of these dendrites, dendritic spines. So it, you know, it just needs to touch there and do its whatever it does, and and there will be that that neuron will fire. And if it does it in a, you know, even a, a small area of the cortex, that that whole area will light up. Oh, good. So um, there are a couple of questions. Let me just mentioned, yeah, recordings will be available of this. Um, and you'll probably get an email in the next couple of days. Uh, all those who registered will get an email saying where they can watch the recording. Um, this person says, outstanding work. Do you see this work having a role to help the dying to cross the threshold? And thank you so much. Well, uh, what we're hoping is that this work will become an accepted thing, a, a, a scientific revolution, uh, that people will, um, that neuroscientists and, and physicists and philosophers, all, almost 90% of them are probably uh, materialists, physicalists. <laughs> um, but, you know, if, if, if you can show a, you know, a rational viewpoint, a framework that explains a whole lot more and explains existing knowledge much better, and that's, that's the goal of our, uh, primary goal of our work. But when that happens, then the reality of the spirit will be clear to a whole lot of people. And it will go a long distance towards overcoming fear. Fear. And doubt. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Dementia. Can you comment on that at all from your work? Absolutely. So dementia um, is, is a physiological condition in the brain <clears throat> of various types. Um, there are various forms of dementia, but <clears throat> Alzheimer's involves plaques that form in the brain. And, and basically the, the plaques or whatever the structural changes prevent the mind from, uh, from interfacing with, with that area of the brain. So, uh, and the hippocampus is, uh, are really very sensitive to this. And so people's um, episodic memory starts to be blocked. Uh, it's very hard to remember, to recognize people, to remember names. You, you can, if you lose your hippocampi, uh, you can still have your semantic knowledge, which has a different interface. It's a direct interface with the cortex because it's the mind working with the semantic knowledge. But the hippocampus is, is recalling uh, episodic, that is, your experiences, past experiences, and this can be blocked. And then, of course, it, 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 dementia can progress further. Uh, and, and there are different forms of dementia, not just uh, dementia that goes after the hippocampus. It can be prefrontal dementia and 
that there are behavioral uh, changes with that because this the mind loses the ability to to um, modulate uh, one's behavior. Uh, now, there's an interesting aspect of dementia that um, is called terminal lucidity. When somebody, and this usually happens when the, per, the patient is close to death, there is a loosening, ultimately, of the mind from the physical body. And, and at that time, and this also can be observed um, in what's called shared death experience, when a person is dying, one can, some people can, and can see this, and multiple people, multiple witnesses can see the same thing of the, of the spirit body, spirit, you know, the soul, the spirit, separating from the physical body, physical body. Well, in, in, uh, in the latter stages of dying, um, the dying person will um, have visions of deceased relatives uh, coming to them, visiting them, and they you know, they're looking up, they're looking up in the corner and saying and talking to somebody, but nobody else can see what's going on. Mm -hmm. And those are deceased, usually deceased relatives, um, parents, for example, or spouse, deceased spouse coming to help them uh, make the transition. Well, in, in dementia, this sort of thing also happens where the mind is loosening and, and, and this would happen. So in all of these cases, the mind appears to be loosening from the physical brain and you can still, you're half in and half out and you can see things and you can remember things. Now, if you're a dementia, you now your memory comes back. And if you can still talk, and that's that's possible in these cases. They they you know they call up their children and say, you know, um, here I am <laughs> when they haven't talked, <laughs> recognized anybody for years, decades, and uh, <clears throat> sometimes these these final uh, uh, interchanges with uh, their children or. Uh, you know, spouse uh, is very touching, but but then then this is an indication that their mind is going to separate, and mm -hmm. so they do ultimately die, usually within a day mm -hmm. of these experiences. So terminal lucidity. So anyway, it has to do with the mind, the mind's connection with the brain, and and if you're still tied into your physical body, and you have dementia, then you you have these uh, deficits. Okay. Um, a question came in about Libet's work. Yeah. Totally amazing. Um, have there been other scientists who validated the timings? Oh, yes. That's, yeah, we mentioned that. Uh, we were surprised to see it because we, you know, have not been following for the last several years what's been going on. And we, we looked and, wow, there's a whole field, conscious wow. processing. Uh, that is recognizing that, oh yeah, if, you know, if, <clears throat> if the mental activity does not get beyond a certain point, they, they cannot, they're not aware of anything, even though they were given a, some stimulus, a very, uh, very minimal stimulus and uh, liminal st stimulus that they call it. And, um, and, and then if, if they do allow it to go to conscious awareness, then, then they can see what's going on. And usually it, it, you know, what's unconscious is happening in the back. And if, as it moves forward, and as we showed in, in reading a word, it doesn't become act, uh, conscious until it reaches the temporal area and prefrontal area. So um, the, um, yeah. So it moves forward, and that's where we become aware of what it is that we see or hear. And, um, and so, yes, it, this is now well validated, although they don't reference Libet as if he didn't exist. And they gave him a heck of a time in the 80s, 90s, and uh, until he died. Uh, he is... Um, is one of the giants of uh, 
neuroscience. Yeah, yeah. I guess we have time for one last question. Um, and uh, well, people are saying how much they want to express their gratitude to what you brought tonight. Um, and this has to do with precipitants, this question. You mentioned calcium ions. And yes. Steiner mentions in our perceiving, we have precipitant of silicic acid. And oh. in our thinking, we have a precipitant of the philosopher's stone, carbon. Yeah. Can, is, is, are these related in some way? Well, they're not related chemically. <laughs> <laughs> no, right. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think he's talking about um, uh, um, elemental carbon or elemental silicon or elemental silicic acid. I think he's talking about a refined <clears throat> version of that. And I would not be at all surprised that that's, that's happening there. Um, uh, but that's, uh, we, we go, what we're trying to do is, is take the, where the neuroscience is and say, hey, look, you know, this would work. This does, this is the way it works. And, and, um, and so a, a lot of the neural activity is, is ions that go in and out of the uh, neuron. And so the action potential, well, you could see it, it just, when, it, when it, there's an action potential, it just spreads throughout. But it, the main thing that people have been focusing on is it goes down the axon to excite some other and neurons. But there's this backward propagation. So, yeah. so there is that. Um, and this is an exchange of, of positive ions in and out of the, um, of the neuron itself. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been absolutely wonderful. I am, um, as Deborah says, you guys are building bridges. Um, good. Thank Keep you. Going. <laughs> that, that's really uh, going. <laughs> very important work. And I can see, um, you know, I'm going to have to have more conversations with you guys about the Mistech endeavor to try to have a moral impulse from the ego proceed all the way down to an etheric vibration that causes a specially tuned machine to do the intended operation. Oh, interesting. Interesting. And prostheses are already trying to do that. Yes. Yes. And there, there is, yeah, I mean, there's this uh, people with spinal injuries, um, there is a, an etheric bridge that apparently can be built that way. Yeah, yeah. Well, all of you who participated, I wish you all a good night or good morning in some cases. <laughs> I see we have some from New Zealand participating here. Um, it's wonderful how we can do this all around the world at the same time. Yeah. So, Robert and Suzanne, absolutely wonderful, absolutely Delighted to have you again. I was uh, at their house several months ago. And uh, so it's, it's wonderful to see you all again and to have all of you as our guests tonight and look for more um, from this tech. We hope these will be an interesting series of webinars for you. Thank you all. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Good night. Good night, Bye. everyone. You can unmute now. <laughs> Good night. You. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye now. Thanks so much. Bye.